All right, welcome back to AI for Cybersecurity. Our next panel is titled Protecting Remote Workers with AI. Please join me in welcoming our panelists to the virtual stage. Hello, hello everyone. Can you all hear me? Yes, you can. <laughs> all right, so we're so happy to be here. Thank you very much, Patrika. Um, super excited. I was thinking we could all go around and give brief introductions, which I will begin. My name is Daniel Lackland. Some of you may know me. I'm the content lead at AI4, and my job is to work with speakers to create the best content possible for all our events. And I'm very excited to be here today. Really excited to talk to Jeff and Partha more about their areas of expertise. Uh, Jeff, over to you. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Moore. I am the, the Chief Product Security Officer for a medical device company called Draeger. Uh, we are based out of Germany, uh, work all over the world. And I'm really happy to be here and looking forward to talking about this topic. Hey, Partha, I think you're still muted, actually. Oh, sorry. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Daniel. Hi, everyone. This is Partha Chakravarti. I'm the Associate VP and Head of Cloud Security, Security Innovation and R&D for Humana. And I'm really glad to be here today. All right, thank you so much, Partha. Thank you so much, Jeff, for being here. Um, so if I understand this correctly, the questions are gonna flash on the screen. I'll prompt you both um, to begin the discussion and then we can just go from there. It's gonna be very free flowing. Sounds good. So I think we're ready for our first question. Uh, and here it is, perfect. All right, so the first question is, how has the shift towards remote work changed how your organization approaches cybersecurity? Uh, and Jeff, I'd love if you could just kick us off there. What do you think? I don't think the, 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 there's been a massive change to how we do cybersecurity. There's been more of a focus on, because we've always had remote workers in our, in our environments, right? It's been more of a focus on how to do a lot more around um, security awareness, making sure that you know, they can get in. Also making sure that they have the right tools and we have the right tools to help protect them out in the, in the public. Whereas before, I hate to say this, the, uh, the perimeter was, in, was outside the building in theory. Now it's, it, you know, our people are all over the world. I see. Partha, what do you think? So uh, first thing is that I'm not going to talk about any particular company, not even my current company, Human or any other company, but in general in industry, right, how it changed compared to 2019. So what happened in 2019, all of a sudden pandemic, everybody is working from home, right? Pretty much every company had a remote work capability, but what the company struggled that time was the capacity, right? We never planned for 100% of the remote workers working remotely. There was issues with bandwidth, there was issues with appliance capacity pretty much everywhere. So that forced organizations to think differently traditional way of doing remote work was through your VPN, your VPN concentrator and VPN gear. But there were challenges as you are reaching your capacity, you cannot upgrade your, your infrastructure, which is a hardware component on the fly. You had to look in a software-based solution and the concepts like software defined parameter and all which were pretty much on paper, not widely deployed, those things become in traction because that's the only way you can get your capacity on scale. And at the same time, you can also keep securing your remote worker infrastructure. So in general, it pushed many new technologies and also the security um, architects and the security leadership to think different ways, not only implementing software defined networking or adding capacity, but also performance issues, right? There were uh, challenges where you could not do backhauling, bringing everything back to your corporate network and then having an internet access. So we had to do like split tunnel. You have to distribute the traffic that even from my laptop, some portion of the traffic has to go out directly to internet for performance and capacity reason. Then we have to do a zero trust security and software defined uh, networking and implement additional controls to ensure while you are accessing your corporate resources, security is still paramount and we have to do the extra work to take the corporate protection as Jeff said, like previously it was in the parameter. Now you are taking it distributing to 
our home, right? When we are connecting with the corporate devices or standard devices. So it had to push all the organizations to re-architect, rethink, redeploy a lot of solutions. Most of the organizations I worked with, or even I have seen when I spoke with my peers and peer group discussions. So it, it definitely made a change the way the security was done in 2019 and 2020. But the good thing is that it was very agile and everybody responded pretty quick to meet the uh, need of the hour. I can't, I can't argue with that at all because it, zero trust networks became the buzzword of 2020, right? How can we balance the, the, the current technology and at the same time give access from the outside world? And it, it, you know, outside of that, there was also a huge demand for new technologies and VPN concentrators that people couldn't keep up with. So they pushed the software defined networks really in the right direction, to be honest with you. But also that is a big challenge for security teams and network teams because zero trust networking is more than just network. It's also understanding your data, your location where your data is, even in some places, your compliance, who can access your data, right? That you, you didn't have before. So it's a, it's a well-balanced uh, machine that for a start looked at the beginning like it was going to topple over, to be honest, you know? And honestly, there's really good architects and people out there helping out, talking in public about how to help people get in the right direction. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's very interesting to hear you both talk about that. Um, you thank you for your answers. Um, I think actually, yeah, I mean, we're going to go into more depth, obviously, in the other slides as well. So. Um, yeah, I think we're ready for the next slide. Cool. Okay. Yeah. You both touched on it a little bit, but so, you know, which new threats are you seeing with the shift to remote work? Um, and you know, examples, please, insofar as is possible. <laughs> um, you want to start with Partha? Yeah. Thank you. Sure. So Daniel, I mean, I will tell you like the threat landscape does not. Okay. When I say like threat landscape doesn't change, the threats we are talking about, like the phishing and all those attack vectors and threats, that remain the same. The thing yeah. is that right now, the, the the likelihood of actually getting attacked by those back vectors are increasing. Just because right now I'm working from home, right? In many cases, because of, as I gave you an example, right? Previously, you used to connect using your VPN concentrator. All of a sudden, 100,000, 200,000 users are connecting at the same time. Your gear cannot handle that load. So, and again, software-defined networking and all those stuff, that requires a little bit of POC. You have to test and integrate those features in your environment. That takes time, right? A little bit of time. Day one, you could not go there. Now, between the time when you transition from the legacy ways of doing work to the newer ways of software-defined networking, where most of the time you implement a, a, a SDP gateway, right? Which is based on your Kubernetes and, and your containerized structure where you can get on-demand scale and volume. Bef I mean, by the time you transition to the newer ways of doing business, there is a gap. And during that gap, what many companies had to do is struggle a lot while they're adjusting and how to cope, uh, like, you know, keep pace with the volume needs, right? So some of the things where open up a, a, a split tunnel connection where you are basically allowing the users to access some of the services through a split tunnel, maybe your WebEx, maybe your Zoom network or, or something else. In some cases, the companies come up with solutions where you are breaking up, you are not sending everything through your traditional VPN connection. Some of the traffic, which is considered not so significant or not so critical, secure, or having crown jewel, you are tunneling it through a different route and you are getting it filtered through a cloud-based proxy server, right? So all of those attack vectors, like the your phishing or clicking a bad link, eventually getting a dropper and getting an exploit, right, against you and eventually infecting your network, still remains the same. Chances are more. The hard work that the security guys had to do is that while they are, rev you know diverting the traffic and doing a split tunnel, they had to take the same security policy and apply it there as well. So that even if you are not using corporate VPN connection, right? Maybe you are not using your corporate applications, you are using standard internet browsing or a Zoom video, you are using a different channel. But even during that channel, you want to make sure like you don't click on something, right? Or you don't get an infection or unintentionally, you are not leaking any information which could which can cause like a potential impact because your data is in your laptop, it stays where you have a corporate asset. So what I will say is that while the, the attack vectors largely remained the same, 
the overall volume of those attack vectors and the frequency and the likelihood of getting those have increased because of the remote work architectural changes the companies had to go through. And that is why security teams actually had to work extra hard to accommodate those and still protect the user while giving the same level of productivity they were used to when they were using on-prem. So that's my thought. So I would like to hear Jeff, your views on it. <clears throat> well, I can't argue with any of those points because actually you nailed a lot of the points I was going to bring up. What I will say that what some of the threats that were happening were a lot of phishing as well, phone, phone calls. So people would be getting called and trying to get uh, into the organization via uh, phone calls. I'm the help desk, I'm the server, service desk, plus the phishing mails. But what also the security teams had at the beginning, maybe for the first four, up to four months, five months, was anybody who had user behavior analytics suddenly had a ton of false positives, confusing data coming in. So they spent a lot of time trying to fix problems that were being brought up because of how people were changing the way they operated, how they came into the environment before they came in via this VPN. Sometimes they were never out of the organ out by a VPN because they didn't actually have that possibility because they weren't allowed to work remote at the time. So there was a lot, a lot of false positives, a lot of work that security teams had to do to catch up, figure out what was wrong, what was right. And then on top of that, they had a lot of uh, phishing attacks around everybody wanted to know about Corona. Everybody wanted to know about solutions around that. Now there are, I'm seeing attacks and, and my peers are seeing attacks about how to get quickly on the list to get the, the, the vaccine. In the States, it's going to be soon. It's going to be uh, tax time. They're going to add that on top as well. So that the, 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 the threats, like you know, my esteemed colleague has said, are the same, right? They don't really change, but the, the way they they move or the chances are, are better. When you're at home, you're in a different posture to start with. You're not, you're totally relaxed. It's your house, things are normal, right? Your wife brings you a cup of tea, you don't pay attention, you click. You know, things happen like that that are not planned or because of the way that the mindset of happen, happens. So, you know, it's, it's a combination of this great pandemic we're having, being at home and things changing that bring the perfect storm slowly to, to organizations. And the security teams, have been overworked over the last year. Yeah, that's interesting. Are there any are there any threats that are actually less likely to occur in a work from home environment, or is that not something that is typically top of mind or, or happening? <laughs> I'm going to say inside the threat because now they're outside. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Or you can look at the other way, right? Even if you're sitting outside, like all of us are insiders, so you can have both at the same time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But I agree, the overall volume has increased. The classic mechanism stays the same, yeah. but just because of the, the scare of the pandemic, right? People don't know of that uncertainty, right? A lot of questions about even when the vaccines are coming, what is the actual number? What are the precautions you need to take? Those were being used as one of the mechanism to target the user because everybody will be most, most likely reading those information about COVID. And then you just start quickly inject and create more issues, right? And so, overall, the load was more on the security professionals. Yeah, I mean, one of the ones I saw lately uh, was a phishing attempt was, hey, um, try and find out where you will be online, uh, in line to get your COVID in injection. If you're in this country, this country, get there. feel free to forward this email to your friends so that they also know where they are, right? Yeah, that's very interesting. Yes, you have you have uh, you know hacker pe people who are representative of threats who are changing their behavior too in response to this, like you just said, which is very interesting. The next question I know is also going to touch on this a little bit. I know we talked a little bit about data changing, Jeff. You mentioned. Um, so the next question is, I believe, um, has AI played a role in this changing cybersecurity environment? Um, and I know you talked a little bit about data, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this question specifically. So I, I am not seeing, I keep hearing AI in the cyber, uh, cyber security industry, but I've yet to see it realistically. I've asked people about it to show it to me. Um, I'm seeing a lot of heuristics, a lot of machine learning, assisted and non-assisted machine learning, which is okay, right? But I, I hate to say that the AI word is being beaten to death in, in the industry right now. Um, you know, it's, it's coming slowly, right? I think 
it, it's also something you have to put trust in, right? And to be honest with you, with everything changing in the current things, I don't think AI would have been the right thing to have. Machine learning is is, is well is well out there and well documented, and, and you're seeing both uh, assisted and non-assisted machine learning helping. But for me, I yet to see it actually helping the current uh, environment, right? But I, I believe that maybe in two to three years, we're gonna have a form of uh, AI for security tooling, right? A lot of the stuff that people are talking about AI is a level of orchestration and, um, and uh, heuristics. And I, to be honest, some of the big companies out there talking about it, I've sat down with them with my data scientists and said, show me, we're under NDA, let's go through this. And to date, very few have actually been able to come up. And when we got down to it, much to my disappointment, it hasn't been what I've expected. But it's coming. Let's be honest, it will be coming. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, very interesting. Partha, do you have a sim- do you share a similar opinion on kind of the the definition of you know the term in cybersecurity settings, or you might you've had a different experience? What do you think? So I, I agree with Jeff, right? Today, every product and company that we meet there is hardly anybody that doesn't mention that we do machine learning or we do artificial intelligence. Now, for us, we are, we are the consumers of this technology to protect our organization. We see the benefit in one sense is that what we're looking is that, to Jeff's point, automation and orchestration, right? There are a lot of manual work because of the volume is increasing, the threats are increasing and you have to handle a lot. There is not enough people always available to do that work. And manually, we cannot define what is a known good or known bad. That day is probably, I mean, we can still do something at a basic macro level, a definition of good and bad, but the definition between good and bad is getting so blurred that you need some extra intelligence, which is, which has to be defined on the fly by the system and the software and the intelligence of the tool right? I cannot manually go and define. I give you an example of when you talk about new concepts like software defined uh, parameter or protecting your infrastructure, you always talk about segmenting your network, right? Mm -hmm. Now you segment your network. You can create some broader boundaries that I don't want my application A to talk to application B. But invariably in every company, you will find there is not enough detailed inventory of which subcomponent needs to talk to which subcomponent, right? So on the runtime, when you start taking those capture and put it in a data analysis tool like R or anything, you'll see like a spaghetti noodle, right? As a human being, at that point of time, even if I'm the application owner and somebody asks me, tell me which flows are allowed and which flows we should eliminate from it in order to make sure we are reducing the attack surface, we are removing the risk, or lowering the risk at the same time giving you productivity. I cannot answer that. So I need some sort of a machine intelligence. So the software tools, they are, I agree with Jeff, they're coming, they're using it more and more, but they are doing some sort of, I mean, they tap some of the capabilities of machine intelligence to give us that view, right? Be it your software defined parameter for remote workforce. You have to look at a lot of parameters on the runtime where the user is coming from, right? If you see a request is coming from, you know, Alabama, the very next second is coming from New York, you know, something is suspicious, right? If the IPs keep changing or if the posture keeps changing of the browser, right? I mean, you are making this request from a Mozilla with some type and then within a fraction of a second, your browser type and headers and everything is changing, you know, something is suspicious. As a human, we cannot analyze that volume of log and make a determination. So we rely on the systems they claim to use artificial intelligence. To me, some sort of an intelligence, some sort of a software logic might not be fully utilizing the magic of AI, but it is coming, but it is going into that area where more and more definitions will be defined by the systems to make a good versus bad decision and block it, as opposed to we know something and you know hard code and create, okay, this is allowed, that is not allowed. We have to move from that mindset because that mindset is not scalable and going forward, it will be even more difficult. So in conclusion, I will say AI, maybe to some extent is being utilized. I am not an AI expert to know all the algorithms and everything deep inside, but at least that intelligence and tapping it is coming more and more, which is a good thing for us in cyber community overall. 
Yeah, especially with the uh, with the uh, deficit of people who can lose security. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Can you actually say more about that, Jeff? You you both agreed on the deficit of talented people, yeah. Chad. I think. So it's it's getting really hard to get really good talent out there. There's a couple of really good schools out there trying to bring talent out there, but there's a massive deficit, and they're talking about in in in, in the level of millions, right? One to two million people are missing from security, and will be for the next few years. And what's happening is, you know, the industry is getting better and better and the tools are getting better and better, but the people have been getting less and less. In fact, just, just to say how bad it, it is getting, I've known a couple of my peers who are actually getting out of security because of the stress. Right? A lot of people don't realize how much stress this, this job is. You know, you have a lot of, a lot of uh, pressure going on. And as we go further down the line, companies are getting bigger, data is getting bigger. Um, a lot of the workloads are getting uh, more challenging. So you're not having the amount of people to, to, to uh, do a SOC, do your first, second and third level uh, um, tr uh, analysts. Then you've got your forensics people, your, your, security, um, your security engineers, and it just keeps going. And I'll be honest, finding amazing um, security architects are getting harder and harder because now you've got to balance cloud, this cloud part of it that people never knew before, right? Security architecture was partly network architecture as well back in the day. Now it's getting bigger and bigger at understanding the differences. And the, there, is, there is a huge drought of good people out there. And there are some amazing people out there. Plus, where you want to work. Now, the benefit of this, this, this pandemic is remote work has become you know, viable and companies are thinking about it. But also, they're also thinking about hiring you know, further afield. <laughs> also, some of my colleagues are also flying further afield and living further afield because it's cheaper and better for them and their families. So there is, there is a deficit and it will, you know, orchestration is one side of trying to fix some of that problem, but it, it won't be the key thing to fix the problem. And AI maybe further down the line will add another layer on top to help reduce that deficit and bring it a lot more closer to making sure you've got the basics and the balance. Gotcha. Interesting. Okay, so, so that was very informative for me, especially. Um, you also both said that, you know, even though maybe the AI tools that you're interested in having aren't at least obviously available right now. Um, do you think that those tools that you're describing, if they were available, would fare better than maybe the human in reacting to kind of a new threat landscape brought on by COVID or some other big change like that? I mean, is that is that something that would be also make something like that more interesting for you in addition to a lack of you know human talent? So it maybe if I can go right. Uh, uh, so I, I think yes, it will be right. So. What I see is that in future, this machine intelligence is going to drive a lot of the heavy lifting that with human, we cannot have an army of people to do it with time, I mean, in effectively in time and within the cost. So we definitely have to rely on those machine intelligence more and more because the type of attack vectors and also the volume will increase over a period of time. But at the same time, I don't disagree, right? We definitely need to have the human intelligence. Eventually, when you create the machine intelligence, there is a human behind every machine. Like all the logic, all the algorithms that you define, it is created by someone, right? Machine is iterating it, it's doing better, right? Because it is probably it can execute more than a human is doing right now. But even with those tools, you need to have the cyber talent, somebody who understands why we need to do and what exactly we need to do, right? If you, I mean, if you talk about, you are in a situation, you are doing a firefighting and you have a bunch of tools, which has the machine intelligence and you can 100% rely on those, be it false positive or false negative. I don't think we are there, right? We still need some human supervision and apply our intelligence, even though the machine is telling us, does it make sense? Does it correlate with the event I have? Does it correlate with our application or environment, right? So that kind of a judgment, we have to do. And moreover, while we are orchestrating and automating things and also relying on machine intelligence, we need sort of a conductor of an orchestra, right? That is the experience and the knowledge. It comes from the human brain, which defines all of your rule book and what you need to do and how you need to react and what you need to really look at. That is not going to change. So overall, the skill and talent will always be needed. The, the need will be more as we progress more. But the thing is that with these tools and, and, and AI coming in, it will make it easy, but it will not replace the human being. I mean, you don't need an army of people, but you will still need more knowledgeable and skilled people to 
to define what those tools will be doing for you uh, to protect your organization. I fully agree there. The, the, the difference there also is actually the people that you're going to need are going to even have to be better security people than, than, yeah. than what you'd hire off the street, right? So you're now looking for people who are better, better qualified, better experienced to make those decisions. Plus, there are some things that the, the machine may not be able to understand, like the business of uh, how the business runs, how things go, how marketing is, it's suddenly marketing is doing something somewhere else and that you've got to be able to figure it out quickly because it's, it's what you know and the machine doesn't. But there's also a, a negative side of this. We've seen AI poisoning before, right? We can, we can make, you know, we've seen the AIs that have been released by Microsoft suddenly become racist based on things. And we're expecting that there. So you're going to have to have AI to watch AI and people to see this shouldn't be happening as well, right? So there's, there's, it's, going, it's going to be a shift and, and a shuffle. But, you know, like, like we've been saying, you're going to need still those really good people to make make those decisions right as well cool yeah. um that's great patrick i think we're ready for the next question if you wouldn't mind yep all right cool um so looking ahead uh do you envision going back or are these work from home programs changes uh excuse me work from home changes to your cybersecurity programs here to stay and either of you can kick that one off. I'll start with that if you don't mind. Sure. Well, let's be honest. It's like everything, right? Once something starts happening, it's here to stay in some in some form and fashion, right? And um, I think it's a great thing. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, I've known people, peers, friends, that this work from home has actually made their life better and their family better, right? So they wouldn't want to lose that. There's been some interesting studies, depending how you take them. I read one somewhere was like 56% of the women want to go back to work and something like 48% of the men don't, right? It's, it's interesting studies out there that are going around. But honestly, I think companies to keep a competitive edge, a interesting uh, environment for employees have to have this balance now, right? And it's shown where companies didn't think it was possible that it is possible. Are people working more? Maybe, maybe not. Depends on the person, to be honest with you. But in general, I think that these won't go away, right? You'll have a balance because you need a balance, but also people need people as well. Don't get me wrong, right? We are in some cases pack animals, some of us, right? And we'll want to be together. The introvert may not, but in some cases, the only way you get things done. Now, will that help my cybersecurity program? No. Why? Because honestly, when I walk down the corridors before pandemic, somebody go, Jeff, ah, we're working this project. You have five minutes to have a chat, right? Just because they saw me and it jogged their mind that they needed to talk to security. I found more incidents out that way, right? People are less likely to bother people through chat in some cases, or you'll miss it, right? If you're in a company with thousands of people, I get thousands of messages. I miss messages left and right. Maybe that's where AI can help me. Um, but I think, you know, they're here to stay. Um, and I think that's great, to be honest with you. I think, it, you know, the world is, is built for multi, uh, multi-functional people that work different ways. Um, I'm a bit worried in some cases about some of the digital nomads who are traveling around doing things that may actually be breaking compliance or regulatory law by, by being in a different country, looking at data in some cases because of the, the uh, requirements of the law and possible uh, impacts that can have. But, you know, I, I think... Anybody who thinks that their company is going to go 100% back to work, I think there may be one or two companies out there, right? But otherwise, I, I, I see it here to stay. And, and the, the programs are going to have to evolve to go around it and work with it. Yeah, and I, I absolutely agree, uh, Jeff, uh, with you. I, I don't think it's going back. For me personally, it did not make any difference because for the last 10 or 12 years, I have been mostly working from home. I do travel. I mean, I have been... Uh, you know, visiting all the office locations where my team is and maybe once a month or once in two weeks, there are some in-person discussion, whiteboarding, brainstorming sessions are there. Those are, those will continue to happen. The thing which will change going forward is that when we all started working from home, we all started missing that in-person whiteboarding, like ideation, exchanging, like doing and building an architecture. Right? Yeah. It was so easy for us when everybody's in the room, draw something and then you know, discuss about it and figure it out what needs to be done. Now to replace that, a lot of collaboration tools have come up. Like a lot of cloud-based collaboration tools have come up. 
where you are doing an architecture diagram discussing about your problem and solution that stays in cloud. That is your company's IP, a lot of critical information, right? Yeah. So what will increase is that going forward as more collaboration tools come up because people are not going back 100% work from office only, it will be this mode. There will be a split. Some companies will not force people to go back. It will be optional. Some companies may even decide to shut down some of the offices or even do remote because it is cheaper but more and more collaboration tools will be coming. That will make the job for cyber more harder. So at some point of time to meet the scale requirement, right? you cannot do a manual review or architectural review of each and every tool. You may have to rely on a tool to do an automated pen testing, automated arc review, yeah. a lot of automated thing for you to keep up with that volume. That's where I think those intelligence in the machines will come more handy. But I agree, it's not going back to previous mode that you work from home office only it's not going to happen and i also think in some cases it will stifle innovation for some companies because and also security as well because i agree those whiteboarding sessions are awesome right and you know you're in a room with five six seven people you're all talking about it sometimes two people right there will talk among themselves and then give an idea right you can't get that anymore with remote working and stuff like that right it doesn't quite work nobody's built the collaboration tool with a side channel chat that can be done, right? So these are the things that are missing in some of the cases. And I, I, I'm, you know, normally in my office, I have a huge whiteboard, right? Um, because, you know, security architecture and all that is, is a little bit more complicated sometimes, you know? So yeah, I, I do agree. And I, I think that, you know, we are just gonna have to find the best way. And I'm not gonna lie, the amount of new collaboration tools I've had on my desk over the last uh, 12 months have been unbelievable. That's very interesting. Now, Partha, you actually mentioned that you think um, you think it's here to stay, the remote work. And you think actually, you know, we might have a hybrid model, I think you mentioned, where some people are in office and some people aren't. Um, you know, looking at your own organization or really just, you know, to your own knowledge in general, I mean, is that going to mean that there's going to be a whole different suite of tools and processes and, you know, approaches to cybersecurity for like half of your, you know, people and then a different approach for the other half? Or is that not how you would see it? I mean, our, for cyber professional, again, I'm not going into the company specific thing, right? For cyber professional, it doesn't make, make sense to have two different processes and tools and all, right? The more you can unify, the more you can cut down on your resource, you can be more agile to meet the requirements and needs, right? Whenever an incident is happening. So I think it is going to be the same, right? The tool, the application of tool or implementation will be a little bit of different because I mean, I'm hearing it's a public knowledge. If you read in, uh, read in LinkedIn, there are a lot of companies who are saying that coming to office is optional, right? I'm not forcing you to come to office, right? Okay. For your work, you have to do like some team bonding events and all those will continue. Otherwise COVID has proved one thing previously, in every job ad where you see, right? There was something like location has to be in DC, New York City. How many of those jobs you see that right now mentioned that job code has to be this? It has proven you can work if you're in IT from anywhere in the world and the collaboration tools are getting better, but human interaction will continue. But to answer your question, I don't see two sets of processes and tools will be there for a longer period of time, for immediate near future. There may be till the company is mature. Eventually, those tool set will also mature where it will be one form factor. It doesn't matter whether you are home or you are working from office. It should be able to cater to both of your uh, needs. So that's what I, I believe the world is uh, heading towards. No, I do agree. And I think the other point that you have to say there is, is when the more processes you have and the more the split the processes are, the more you're li liable to miss things, right? And you don't want your security analyst to try and say, well, one second, is he at home? Is he at the office? Oh, my God, let me go look at this. Plus, it becomes an audit nightmare as well. So, Yeah, wow, thank you both for that. Um, and so we have one more question also. Um, so if Patricia would be so kind. And we've been talking about this now just a little bit, um, but you both talked about potential for a lot more human error when it comes to remote work. So I think this is going to be really uh, fitting. From a people process and technology perspective, which processes have changed or training programs have been implemented to cope with work from home? Um, and I'm really personally very interested in this one. Uh, Jeff, you want to start this one off? <sighs> or Martha, it doesn't matter. No, 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 no. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just trying, to, trying to put my thoughts in order, right? I mean, yeah. it, it's, it's interesting because, you know, what processes have changed, it's quite in, it, 
interestingly enough, the processes are quite often just being modified and this, the, you're actually not even seeing, but a lot of the processes that were changed uh, from me, my colleagues and all that stuff was starting about VPN, how, how things are accessed and how things are, are done because people are outside of the organization, right? And in, in, in some cases, you know, like I said, the technology perspective there, uh, prospect was a, a lot of my colleagues had to rush and, and get POCs up and, and running for, for uh, zero trust networks and, and understand the data and bring people in. But training programs have been very interesting because I've seen a huge um, spike in ransomware training, right? Because that's that's going out. And um, a lot of my colleagues who actually work for several, uh, several um, companies that do this um, have said that they they've gone up through the roof, right? Having a lot of the uh, security awareness, um, new compliance trainings because people are, are working from home. If you're HIPAA compliant, you can't have your wife come in and look over your shoulder when you're doing things, you know? So you're looking at all these different um, trainings and compliance requirements you need, right? And those have to funnel into the process, right? Um, some companies have been, instead of doing security awareness once a year, now have been running security awareness every quarter, right? They've had to stream down security awareness, so it's it's not the maybe the 30 minutes they had before. It's now in 10 minute snippets, right? But they've been streamlining them, bringing them down, and you know, and people have been taking them as they have to, right? Because we are in in in, in a situation that has never been before, right? Um, there's no such thing as a new norm because if it's a new norm, it's not normal because normal is normal, right? So when I look at <clears throat> how the organizations I've worked for, my colleagues are working for, processes will always change, right? As, as we move, mature, right? Um, we'll find better ways to do it and more effective. And technology will, will, will always play a part in what security does because that's why we have security now as much as it is before, right? And, you know, and people will have to adopt and change uh, either whether they're working at home, in the office, and things will converge into a lot more streamlined for organizations because Right now, a lot of my colleagues and myself are seeing a lot of different tools, but now we've got to figure out which ones are most effective for us all. And then what are the policies and processes we put on top of those? And those, a lot of us are playing catch up for, to be honest with you. Yeah, and and, and Jeff, I mean, like you, you brought a lot of great points here, right? I mean, from a compliance perspective, some of the things which we are part of our training in every cyber or information organization, right? Before you leave, you lock your machine, right? You, yeah. you you keep your laptop in your drawer or desk. In your when you work from home, those things go away, right? What is the equivalent of those, right? I mean, like we have to do something to meet those regulatory requirements. So those regulatory processes will also evolve over time, and as those processes evolve, the training programs will will change a little bit, right? I don't yeah. see a huge shift in training, but at the same time, I have noticed also one thing because technology is doing good and also people are getting used to so quicker with this whatever you call right the new norm i mean i'm still used to that word new norm this is the new world we live in uh is that when you started that remote work program many companies used to say like do's and don'ts there was an email when you work from home do this don't do it how many of those companies will see, even if you new hire come in, you're giving a laptop and he or she is working from home, sending those do's and don't, no, this has become like part of your, your habit, right? People know it right now. And more so that previously you had to do like a manual do and don't and, and assume that people will read those and do it accurately, right? And yeah. probably there'll be less chances of making mistake. Now you are relying on tools. You are embedding like bunch of tools, part of this thing that even if somebody is not doing it, leaving the laptop maybe unlocked for a period of time, your auto locking is happening. Your disk is more encrypted. I mean, you are ensuring like even the video camera is not turned on where you have an USB, you get an alert or you disable it. Previously, yeah. maybe a lot of your security activities were in the monitor only mode that somebody plugs something into the USB security operations center will get an alert. Now with the new world, they're adopting that. Okay. If you try to plug in something, I'm going to deactivate that device, right? I'm not going to yeah. allow you access. No more time to read the alert and react. Rather, we need to act quickly on it. So that's how I'm cha I'm seeing the changes where training programs will evolve. There will be a little bit of adoption will be there, but the technology will come forward so much that probably will not be a huge uh, kind of a like 
upskilling your entire workforce that you have to do like 20 things differently because you're working from home. This yeah. is becoming a normal thing. And I mean, now even with the technology and some of the systems, it can simply say, if the guy stands up, the camera can see that the guy's left, left, left the, uh, the screen, it can turn it off. There's a lot of, lot of different things. Now you can, you know, my iPhone is, is connected uh, to my, my watch. So it knows that if I'm, if I'm together with that, it, will, it won't ask me for a pin code. You've got all the different tools out there that you will bring into the, into the industry, right? The things that we're, are gonna get harder and harder are really trying to understand where your data is and all that stuff. And that's always gonna be a problem for a company, right? right? And, you know, don't allow people to print out at home because if you're a, a, a health company, there's PII, you know, SPI, it, it just, there's just things that you have to do that you have to keep an eye on, you know. Things are going to be a lot more digital as well. You know, you, you, you know, no more faxes paper here because there's nobody in the office. It's going to be, you need to take a picture with your camera. It's going to send it to somebody to look at. Yeah, that's really interesting. Partha, I really found what you said uh, really neat too, because, you know, we were, we've been talking a lot about how there's going to have to be really great working together between, you know, technology and people, you know, just moving forward in cybersecurity. And it was interesting how you said that, you know, you think that processes are actually not going to have to adopt as much and the technology will shift and actually replace human training. Uh, and I'm curious for both of you. I mean, <laughs> from a cybersecurity perspective, do, would you rather have technology adapt to solve the problems or would you rather, you know, train people in different ways? I mean, it's kind of an interesting little nuance there. I mean, I would probably say like we believe in defense in depth, right? So we don't depend on one single control. So training people is a good thing. You have to do it. There is some deterrent control that you apply, but at the same time, you need to have a technology control. Even if you have 100% technology control, you need human behaviors to make sure like those, some of the things we can avoid. So I think that will be a combination. But my comment was, if you're asking me that, is it going to be a huge shift, a lot of training, right? I have seen, right, a year before when I was first doing like work from home. For me, it's not new. Probably I worked in the last couple of companies, last 10 or 12 years. I've been mostly working uh, from home. But for many others, right, and, and a lot of people in technology sales and all, they know that, right? They always work from like remote workplace and all those stuff. But a lot of enterprises, they used to work from office, like your office location. So initially, last year, I saw like before, it was a big communication from the companies and a lot of do's and don'ts and training those frequencies are actually slowing down. There is no longer that many training things because people got used to it. You have a better technology. But again, I think it will be a combination that uh, will eventually provide us the defense in depth. I will not rely on only one single thing. At the same time, I will definitely use combination, but I will rely more on technology because that is something I can do instantaneously as a backup or provide the coverage as opposed to training 150,000 people, which is going to take some time. But you know as well, compliance requires you to train 150,000 people. Yeah. You have to do it, right? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and the, the, the thing is, is, is technology fits an area, right? People, you know, security is all about people in general, right? You know, it's people, AI doesn't decide to go and steal data, right? Computer doesn't log on and say, I'm going to steal data, right? Um, people make that decision, right? Hackers, insider threats and stuff like that, right? But you also need to make sure that people are aware. And you know what? It doesn't even just mean about security training. I have seen training of people telling people, now you're at home, you need a better chair. You need to drink more, right? Because you, you're stuck at home, you don't get up and, you know. So things are better and worse because we're at home, but they're no better and worse than when we were in the office, to be honest with you, right? So I, I like working from home. I get to see my wife often. I, you know, I miss being in the office because I don't have the ability to, to be very flexible with people and, and on the fly look at things. But I also you know, can concentrate more. Now, let's be honest. A lot of people went through a hard trial you know, trying to understand how to work from home because that was not their routine. right? And that's where right at the beginning, a lot of problems happen, right? both security and regular, because people didn't know where to go. Things were different. You know, in fact, a lot of people, some people suddenly had a laptop they never had before, you know, and all their data was on another system. So it's been an interesting uh, road and challenge for most security because they needed that data and how they were going to get it to them. 
Cool. Thank you for that. So I think we have just probably a minute left uh, for final thoughts on the subjects of remote work, cybersecurity, AI, uh, or really anything else you uh, think, you know, an audience of cybersecurity enterprise leaders might like to hear from you experts. So and if anything comes to mind, no pressure either way. Uh, but I would, say that, I would say that remote work is going to stay and uh, there will be security challenges, but AI and other technology improvements will eventually make it pretty regular and people will see less difference from working from home as opposed to working um, uh, at a workplace. Uh, but there are some compliance requirements and there will be some uh, regulatory requirements where some of the jobs will need to be working from a location. For example, I know like if there are some immigration candidates joining the team, there are some requirement that you need to have a reporting location or something, right? You cannot be anywhere, uh, right? So those will be there and companies have to respect those wherever the legal and compliance things are demanding. Other than that, from a technology and capability perspective, it is going to stay and overall our security capabilities will improve. I mean, we have proved it in last one year and uh, it will increase going forward, right? That we can do even protect our resources and assets when they are completely mobile. No, I agree. And I think w the one thing that we will see is you won't know the difference whether you're working from home or in the office. It would just be the furniture, to be honest with you. And that's the way it should be, to be honest. It has to be that way, right? That there are no different processes from where you work, what you do, but the security will cover you no matter where you are, right? Today in the office, tomorrow on the road, next thing in the plane, you know, and zero trust is here to stay. Software defined networks are here. 5G is going to make things a little bit easier uh, to be remote. So yeah, it's, it's good. Security, security will always be there. We have to. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that was uh, great. Thank you both so much. And I'll let Patrika come back on, but thank you very much. Hey, thanks for having me. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, mate. Thank you so much. Thank you to Dan for moderating and thank you to our wonderful panelists, Jeff and Partha. That was an awesome discussion and we really appreciate you sharing your insights with us. <laughs> All right, so it's time for the audience to move along to your next session. Also along the way, feel free to connect with your peers with some virtual networking, check your connection request, or visit our sponsors just to say hello. Thanks so much, and we'll see you around.